Thank you. Now that we have three different recordings going, <laughs> we can <laughs> begin to talk about our silly little games. It's only two recordings. Well, that's also recording, technically. The, the, li the live stream, while technically, yes, that is recording on TikTok live, where you can watch this podcast a day early, live on TikTok around noon on Tuesdays, Eastern Standard Time. Um, I don't really count that, since we don't... Like, we, la we, we just slap a phone up and then hit go. True. And then it's gone forever. I mean, it's not. It, like, we, we could, could download, download, it. download it. We could easily download it, but the quality is just kind of. You know. Not also, there. if we ever start doing this, like at a, at a, if if this catches on, yeah, which at you know two years in, we're trying now. We're actually trying now. So we're putting in effort. But if this ever catches on, uh, we're gonna and we like start a Patreon or something. We're gonna have to start recording it earlier. That way, we can let people access it earlier. What I'm. Okay, so that's along always those, a thing for a podcast. Along those lines, I'm glad we're litigating this on the podcast. Along those lines. <laughs> We already record Tuesdays post Wednesdays. We do. I think we could do. I think what we should do if we were to do a Patreon was just record a, a, an extra episode so that the regular feed doesn't miss a beat, mm -hmm. but then just maintain the record Tuesday post Wednesday free feeds like Monday or something like that. Mm. That gives us time to like add the add the old. Uh, ads ah. gives us time to create a short or two that can then go onto social media and people are like oh I want this I need this I've got to wait till Monday I should just give them money and watch it now also that's far that's not yeah we're not we're not no. in the realm of we're not in the realm of Patreon I will say I've looked at a lot of creators of much smaller size and less output than us and they have Patreons and I don't want to be one of those assholes like if we're gonna make if we're gonna do a Patreon, I want to be providing some level of like consistently good value. Yeah, that's I think that. I think been a thing thankfully between that we agree on for you know since we started this is like we don't need people just to you know willy nilly give us money because we're you know this isn't just just a side hustle. This is yeah. we're trying to we're trying to actually be a in, 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 give input to the to the environment of D and D and MTG content uh, effectively. I'm trying to get rich. That's not going to happen. I mean, I invest in a 401k. <laughs> not the same thing. At the end of my life, I might be I might be a millionaire. Anyway. <laughs> miserable. And miserable. <laughs> right. the, cor the correlation between those two is rather high, yes. I would say. There's a, I wouldn't say it's... I wouldn't say that it's like a direct correlation between the two, but it's definitely not a... Uh, it's it's, it's it, the Venn diagram is largely overlapping. Mm. It's very largely overlapping. Anyway, welcome to this our Lord's fifty ninth episode of the uh, ten episodes away, guys. We're so close. We're so close. That's like twenty weeks. Yeah, <laughs> it's like half a year in the in the year of our Lord twenty twenty four. We'll be getting to that glorious episode. Yeah. But anyway, this is episode 59 of the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. I'm Connor and I'm Sam. We are the Dungeon Bros. But we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And We've got a sponsor this this week. <laughs> we I would I would like to thank our sponsor this week, M Words at Markov Manor. Thank you to Edgar Markov and Olivia Voldaren for allowing us to preview the newest Magic the Gathering set. But sadly, Plane of Innistrad, ironically, very harsh censorship. Yeah, laws. a lot strange, very strange. ridiculously harsh censorship laws. So we can't say the full title. So we have to say M Word. Three uh, M isn't just adhesive anymore. Find out who's behind. <laughs> But, but I, that's such a dumb joke. I apologize. Find out who's behind all the unaliving on Innistrad. Totally isn't the crazy bloodlust fueled vampires that have been controlling the plane for thousands of years. Thank you, Edgar and Olivia, for letting us preview uh, M words at, at Markov Manor. That's not the name of the actual match of the other. No, so. that, that's a dumb bit. It was a dumb bit. It's a dumb bit. But yeah, um, one, I will, okay, okay, okay. Edgar. Edgar. Edgar Markov. Edgar Markov. Known legendary creature in Magic the Gathering. $150. <laughs> yeah, the, the yes, the eminence Edgar Markov in Mardu, $150, up almost 100% from last, from this time last year. Yeah, uh, people were expecting him to be reprinted in Commander Masters, and then he wasn't, like, at all. No. <laughs> it's stupidly expensive. Um, 
I love my little partner commander mm-hmm. set up with Edgar and Olivia as a replacement for that. I arguably think it's more fun because of the late game splashiness of being able to like pitch a butcher of Malakir, pitch a uh, a Starian the decadent to mm-hmm. like a faithless looting early in the game or a blood token. Yeah, get some get some good card draw in there, and then oh, it's turn seven. Let's bring out Olivia, and then also bring out that bomb for free from the graveyard. And now you're getting fucked. Mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of that. I'm a very big fan of that. Anyway, I'm gonna make a YouTube video about that. Yeah. And other alternatives to Edgar Markov, because $150 is fucking ridiculous. There's actually two other vampires that are Mardu, and they both kind of suck. So Yeah. There are a lot of good yeah. two-color vampires. A lot of great two-color uh, vampires. As we see with both of Edgar, Mar- Edgar Charm Groom, William Brin- Br- Crimson Bride, yep. uh, Streffen. Streffen. Um, Maurer Progenitor, as well as... Um, Ange made of dishonor. There's several. I even like the original Olivia Voldaren, where you're like using her ability to ping things for damage and then mark them and then be able to steal them permanently later. Mm-hmm. It's a fun little, fun little uh, Rakdos shenanigans with Olivia Voldaren. But Mardu is where it's at for the vampires, and it's popular for a reason. Edgar Markov is by far the most popular vampire commander for a big reason yeah anyway that's in the works but that's neither here nor there some other things uh we've we've technically kind of sort of launched a new podcast yeah bonus action bonus action uh we're considering it a duels and mana dorks supplement podcast it's going to be a little interview series a little like a maybe maybe we can even flip it as like a deeper dive into certain subjects like uh we could talk about like for example with the one D mm-hmm. um play test material we can do a quick overview of the podcast and then we can have like our friend norb fell the lab on and we can go for like an hour and a half and just really dig into that uh we recently posted a podcast with randy sackett of the Forged Realm on TikTok to talk about uh, 3D printing in Dungeons and Dragons, talking about burnout, talking about um, like the best way to play these kinds of games. We've been making some shorts about it. You can find those on our TikTok. Yeah. And upcoming uh, last uh, week, we talked to our friend Bearded GM, and this that uh, that podcast will be coming out next week. Yes, February seventh. A nice little extra thing. Uh, that one's a lot more unhinged. Oh my god, uh, you two are <laughs> cut from the same cloth. We are. I would say we are two sides of the same coin but i think we're just a coin you're just the coin we're just the coin we're very we we vibe very much somebody took to a do... coin and flipped into a fountain of mountain dew <sighs> or of zero sugar l8 which is my other addiction yes i have a problem you do you have many I've, problems i have many problems two of them are beverages one of them is the zero sugar l8 the other one's diet cock hmm the delicious, the delicious aspartame riddled Diet Coke, specifically the Fountain Diet Coke from the United Dairy Farmers, is minty. Why is it minty? M- minty, not in the flavoring context. Are they putting minty peppermints in it? it? No, Spearmint? minty, minty in uh, chocolate. Colo- more of a colloquial, like it was fresh, it was clean, it was crisp. You know, much like a chewing gum or yeah. a toothpaste. Well, not no, it doesn't actually taste minty. <laughs> or a I, candy cane. Well, moving on. <laughs> What have we been playing, Sam? I've got, I've got, I've got some interesting developments for what I'm playing. What I want to start with you. What have you been playing in the realm of tabletop, in the realm of video games, vidjas? What's going on? Well, let's see. Uh, I've been continuing to play Horizon Forbidden West. Mm. Uh, it is a, a big game. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to do everything on it, uh, which. A lot of games have come out recently in the past couple of years, big massive games, the Assassin's Creed series and things like that, where they're like these huge, huge maps with a million side quests and sub quests and things like that. And I will say, up until this point, uh, I've been very burned out on those. I'll start mm-hmm. playing and I'll be like, okay, I'm going to try to do all, I, you know, as much as I can. And I'll get 50 hours into the game. And I'm like, I'm not even a third of the way into the game. Yeah. Um, I will say with Horizon Forbidden West, just as massive i keep coming across quests but at the same time i'm also still intrigued with it and Mm. i'm still happy to keep like oh there's another thing i can do all right uh i mean there are you know of course some things like there's a you know every game now has their little in board game mini game in the game i'm like ah i'll do those later if it's needed for an achievement but yeah get the trophies clean up Mm -hmm. clean up the little all, all the stuff i totally get that yeah I don't. I'm not a big fan of the little, of the little extra mini games. Like you don't need them. I don't mind them if they're fun and if they, and especially if the game needs a break from the action. 
uh, which yes. Horizon definitely can at sometimes because it's almost most fights you're in are kind of, are kind of boss fight level. Yeah, you're like I'm just gonna wander. Oh, look, a little side quest. You're gonna wander into. Oh, there is one of the most powerful enemies in the game. Oh, I'm almost beaten it. Oh, there is another mo- one of the most powerful enemies scripted to come in at this. Oh crap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I was like, I, like I did a half an hour boss fight basically last night. Um, but yeah. That's one thing I always I really respected about Final Fantasy 16 is that even though some of the side quests weren't necessarily like story rich or combat rich, like it, the the game didn't fuck around with a bunch of mini games and like s- random side shit that most people don't care and are just kind of filler time. Like it's it's Final Fantasy through and through. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't like I don't like mini game like Spider Man. Spider-Man PS4 with the fucking stealth Miles Morales sections and the MJ yeah. sections and the fucking science things on the tops of the build. Ooh. Or they're just like, yeah, do this little this little flash game from your childhood. I don't want I don't want to sequence DNA in my Spider-Man game. Sorry, I would rather be swinging from the rooftops, being acting a fool. Yeah, and all of that. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, what what else? Anything else? In the I mean, of? and magic. Not. We did uh, last night on our mm-hmm. Monday Night Live. We did some limited, uh, some Ravnica Remastered limited. Mm-hmm. Um, I built an Absorius deck. Did not did not perform how I wanted it to, and I think it was. I was kind of going at, through it afterwards. I'm like, yeah, this this wasn't destined for, yeah, well, for greatness. Yeah, you kind. It was. It wasn't. It wasn't great for you when I pulled two Crypt Ghasts, yeah. a Krenko, and a Priest of the Forgotten Gods. Yeah. Uh, and then made a Rakdos, like, aggro aristocrats thing, it wasn't going to go well for you yeah. at that point. I wanted to do a Golgari, um, a Golgari, uh, Golgari aristocrats thing because I pulled a couple of really good aristocrats pieces for uh, from, the, the, per, uh, from the release. Unfortunately, I did not have – I had one sack outlet mm-hmm. of – and we put aside six de- six packs and we're like, oh, we'll use these. And then while we were opening them, we're like, crap, which ones are the- <laughs> did we put yeah, aside? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> and so anyway, I was still looking through my half box that I opened. And I was like, I have one, one piece of one sack outlet. And that was Ooh. a Demir house guard. Oh, that's not even a good one. No, that's bad. No. So I ended up going with an Azorius. Yeah. Tried to do control, but also kind of failed to read the cards enough to actually make a usable control deck yeah i mean that's a t- that's just a tough thing to balance in general yeah and it's um, also limited yeah i wasn't yeah it was a good time and then we ended up playing some commander and one and one for the commander games was that uh, i won both at the end you won both oh that's right you did win but I, I was I like that. i had this i was like i had this one on fucking lock i was gonna finish you the next turn you always do that <laughs> you always do that where it's like oh it's fine it's fine it's fine it's fine aurelia aurelia three copies aurelia the war seven leader com- seven combats a million damage. Who knew that Aurelia the War Leader was good? I know, right? No one knew that. But, um, but now I know you are excited for some things coming up here in the world oh, of gaming. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, I finally kicked the Minecraft addiction as, um, well, I kind of did a bunch of stuff and nobody seems to be coming back even after I give them great in-game Christmas gifts of, of shulker boxes and stuff. Some people haven't even gone back to their bases and nope. collected them. That is correct. For those of you who are watching the audio only version or listening to the audio only version, he is now staring me down because yes. that describes what I did. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I haven't been playing Minecraft anymore, but I have gone back to the old backlog. It's not really a backlog. It's really a childhood classic of mine. And I'm just trying to fill a little bit of time until uh, Persona 3 Reload comes out like right around my birthday in the early, at the beginning of February. Uh, very excited for that. This Friday? I think it is this Friday. I, I ordered it on Amazon, so we might not get it until, like, Saturday or something. Mm-hmm. But um, Persona 3 Reload, the remake of Persona 3, four modern consoles with a lot of the more modern sensibilities, turn-based RPG, love the Persona series. But in the meantime, I've been uh, doing my roughly yearly playthrough of Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix. Mm. And uh, I know that game so stupidly intimately. It's... It, it it astounds myself sometimes where I play it and I like I know where all the chests are I know where all the enemies are I know what enemies spawn where I know what enemies drop synthesis items to create like accessories and armor and equipment mm-hmm. and I know what keyblades are good and I know what abilities are good like I'm playing on the hardest difficulty 
the critical mode, and if you've played Kingdom Hearts, you know how fucked that difficulty is. And I think I've died, like, twice. Oh. And one of them was just me fucking around with the fucking Lancer Heartless. And I don't want to get into it. But I'm, like, I've been skipping all the cutscenes, so I'm, like, 16 hours in, and I've basically done everything except beat the final boss, and I'm just grinding a bunch of synthesis stuff and just trying to kill time until Persona 3 Reload comes around. But... In the realm of D and D and magic, mm-hmm. um, working on I pulled a Krenko mob boss. Yes, you did. So I pulled a whole bunch of uh, goblins that I have from my collection, and I might slap one of those together. I don't know yet. Um, working on the Quintorius Khan Planeswalker Oathbreaker deck. Um, did some did some upgrades for like Lathril and just, just re- getting a bunch of pieces from Ravnica Remastered yeah. to add to things. But uh, working finally. On this call of the Netherdeep campaign. Yes. It is. It has been a long time coming. I'm using this opportunity to test out some virtual tabletops. Probably going to go with Roll20, but I'm very intrigued by Foundry VTT. Mm-hmm. It just is a lot more in-depth than I'm willing to do right now. That's definitely something I can look into later as the campaign goes on. But uh, it's going to be myself and a bunch of college friends, some people that I were in my previous homebrew campaign that I yeah. ran for like three years. Um we're going to run through the Hopper Duke adventure that we did for uh, the Explorer Guys, Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount, which we will then travel just simply across the mountain to get to Jigao to do Call of the Netherdeep. Jigao. Um, one of the characters, my, friend, my friend's wife, one of my friend's wives, and uh, she's a big Swifty. Mm-hmm. As many people are. Very big Swifty. And uh, she's going to be playing a half-elf bard named Baylor Zwift. So that'll be something I have to contend with. But I can't wait until you throw a Baylor at them. A Baylor. <laughs> and then, and then you get to do the whole, and then you get to do the whole herd of cows joke. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, of course, I've heard of cows. Yes, of course, of course. Um, <laughs> that's such a dumb joke. I love that joke. One exciting thing: uh, one of my college buddies, Brian. He's played in. Uh, he's playing in another Call of the Nether Deep campaign, uh, but he he just wants to play with college friends, so he's doing this. And um, he was going to play a monk. He wanted to be a Way of the Four Elements monk, and I was talking to him about that. And I'm like, hey, the abilities of the Way of Four Elements, it, it's very key point intensive. It's not very satisfying for a lot of people that play it. And we were talking about ways he could recover key points faster. And I was like, oh, uh, about two years ago. Sam and I released a homebrew on DriveThru RPG, the Blood Magic and Hemocraft supplement. Uh, Five dollars on DriveThru RPG if you're interested. It's like thirty-eight pages of of homebrew for mm-hmm. Blood Magic using hit dice to fuel things. And so I I showed him uh, the monk subclass, the Way of Punishment monk that we made. Yeah. And I was specifically showing him the ability of using rolling a hit dice, uh, taking that roll as damage, and then recovering that many key points. Mm-hmm. And he looked at the whole subclass, and he was like, this is kind of exactly what I want to do. Can I just play that subclass? And I said, absolutely, you can. You want to use my creativity? Okay. So, <laughs> so one of my players is now using one of our homebrew classes, Hell which yeah. is pretty fucking cool. Hell yeah. I'm a big fan of that. I'm a big fan of that. Well, let's move on. Let's get into the upcoming releases here. Sam will run through that. But before we do, this is, of course, the Duels of Mandors podcast. You can get it every other week. Watch it live on TikTok on Tuesdays at noon, or you can get it at Wednesdays at noon, Eastern Standard Time for both of those times, on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, our YouTube channel. Uh, we also have a, our TikTok, our Instagram. Uh, you can check out various – we're starting to do some shorts. We did shorts from the Randy Sackett bonus action podcast that we did. We're going to do some shorts for the Bearded GM, I'm sure. We're going to see if we can do some short clips for our regular podcasts as well, see what the workflow is for that, see if we can get sure. – you know, just start out with just trying to do one per sure. podcast. Just trying to do one, you know. Uh, but yes, as we like to go through every week, here's the upcoming releases for Dungeons & Dragons Magic Gathering. Dungeons & Dragons, uh, kind of in an amorphous place right now in the release schedule. We know that we have uh, Vecna Eye of Ruin, Eve, sorry, Vecna Eve of Ruin coming out this year. It's always the eye. It's always that eye, man. It's, it, it's, it's the item. Lore, yeah. It's the item, man. But Eve, Vecna Eve of Ruin coming out this year. We have Quest from the Infinite Staircase also coming out this year. That is the anthology book for the year. And we have... The one D and D, the 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 next edition, not edition of D and D coming after May. 
It's not May. May. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll get into the player's handbook survey results video in a little bit, but they did specify like, hey, people have thought it was coming out in May. Uh, don't know why, but it totally isn't. And it's like, mm, I'm pretty sure you guys said you were aiming for this quarter. Anyway. Uh, then for Magic the Gathering, Murs at Karloff Manor, the pre-release is this Friday as of recording, which is Friday, uh, February 2nd, and then full release is on February 9th of this year. Uh, the Fallout decks will be coming March 8th. Outlaws of Thunder Junction will be pre-release on April 12th with full release on the 19th. Yeah, they announced that at uh, MagicCon Chicago. Um, then we have Modern Horizons 3, which will be coming out in June. The Assassin's Creed Universe is Beyond will be coming out in July. Bloomboro is going is scheduled for QC. And Duskmorn, House of Horror, is coming out in Q4. Yeah, we didn't know that little subtitle there. Yeah, we just... Uh, Maybe that's just us being dumb, but... I don't know. But we, we, we literally just saw that in an article. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh, since we're since we're on the eve of ruin, sorry, the eve of murders at Karlov Manor, <laughs> it takes so much out. I, I try, I'm trying so hard not to say murders of Markov Manor. Right. Um, and I know the professor of the Tolarian Community College in one of his recent videos was not joking. Like, he was seriously calling it murders at Markov Manor a couple of times. Like, just they didn't catch that. Yeah, who 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 over there at Wizards of the Coast decades ago now mm-hmm. decided that Markov and Karlov were not were were good? Yeah, all right. Anyway, two different planes. It's fine. Anyway, we're going. To, we've there's been a ton of set spoilers. Basically, the entire set has been revealed. The commander decks as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about the commander decks last week, mm-hmm. uh, but we're going to just kind of talk about the overview of the set. Sam's going to go over the set mechanics, and then we're going to pull out a couple cards that we're interested in talking about. Yeah. So uh, first off, we have the set mechanics, which include disguise, suspect, investigate, case, and collect evidence. So the disguise is a version of morph where you pay three for a face down. Uh, you pay three to put a card that has skies on it face down and then it's a 2-2 with ward 2 and it can be turned over for its morph cost at any point uh, as a regular timing mm-hmm. action mm-hmm. Um, these cards usually have some sort of effect that comes with them when they're fl- flipped face up uh, but there are also lands and enchantments that have morph costs or they have disguise costs mm-hmm. um, next we have the suspect mechanic which is a condition uh, you sus- when a creature becomes suspected, it gains menace and loses the ability to block. Uh, it's a, a aggro strategy or an aggro mm. encouragement. Um, Gives it a little evasion. little evasion. Uh, you can do it to your own creatures, of course, to give them menace. You, uh, you can give it to other uh, other players of creatures to take away a blocking ability. Mm-hmm. Uh, next we have Investigate. That's not a new one. That's just making a clue token. But a lot of, a lot of cards now say Investigate. Oh, um, yeah. We have cases, which are a new subtype of enchantment. Uh, they come in with a static effect, uh, and then you can solve the case by meeting some condition. And then once they're solved, they gain another effect. Mm-hmm. As a note with solving, uh, if you scroll down to a find a case real quick so we can just read the, there it is, uh, read the reminder text on it. So in this case, it's a uh, case of the Ransack Lab. Uh, it says instants and sorceries cost you one less to cast. Um, so that's its static effect. Then it has the two solve condition, which says to solve, you've cast four or more instance or sorcery spells this turn. If unsolved, solve at the beginning of your end step. Uh, there, ha- I've seen some some miscommu- misinformation with this. Basically, the way this works is when you hit your end step, if you've hit, if you've satisfied the triggers, the trigger to solve it then goes on to the stack, and then resolves. If you don't hit the trigger, the trigger doesn't go on the stack to check. Uh, so basically, in the in the case in the case of the ransacked lab, if you have not cast four or more instants or sorcery spells, that trigger does not happen. Correct. Okay. Uh, but let's, if we look at the case of the locked hot house, uh, to solve for that one, the requirement is you control seven or more lands. So only once you control seven or more an- lands, you hit the end step. Then the trigger goes on the stack. But that's a trigger on the stack that can be interacted with. So if an opponent destroys one of your lands, for example, then it no longer it'll need- check and it'll no longer be solved. Okay. Um, okay, that is interesting. It gives it's giving like uh, the the Forgotten Realms class mm-hmm. energy, but instead of mana to move to the next level of those um, of the classes, it's just 
game actions. Yeah, which I kind of like. Um, I think we're seeing a lot more of that as they uh, in that design space as we go on with, okay, what are some game actions that you can, you know, work towards in a turn or something like that to, uh, to progress the game as opposed to just having more mana. Yeah. Um, because yeah. oftentimes if you know if your mana screwed or if if you just have an infinite source of mana, that's often a way to just win the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, the final thing is collect evidence. Um, this is an additional cost or a, an optional cost to, on some cards uh, in which you can exile cards from your graveyard with mana value equal to the collect evidence uh, number. Um, so if it was collect evidence six, you could exile, I believe, creatures art- or artifacts. It might be all. It might just be all. Um, when, uh, whenever ward collect evidence for whenever it becomes a target. This is for specifically the Axebane Ferex. Uh, this just this card just happened to be close at the screen we were looking at. Uh, whenever it comes target a spell or ability, counter it unless the player exiles cards with total mana value four or greater from their graveyard. So there we go. Uh, unlike the solving for the ca- uh, case, this is a cost. So your opponent cannot do something to interact with it. Um, well, for example, so uh, if you know if it was like, <clears throat> pardon me. Do something, tap to, pay to, collect evidence eight, you get this effect. They can't respond by exiling your graveyard, basically. Mm-hmm. So it's once, part of the casting cost. Yeah, so once you start to collect evidence, you can't be interacted with. Those are just some rules things that I uh, saw noted in some people who have already had access to the uh, sets. Mm-hmm. Um, namely, loading ready, run MTG. Nice. All right, well, uh, we're just going to pull out a couple of cards that we want to talk about. Uh, I first want to talk about one that's been going around Twitter. It's one of the mythics from the set. It's a legendary creature, mono white. Uh, Delny Streetwise Lookout. It's two and a white for a 2-2 human scout. Creatures you control with power two or less cannot be blocked by creatures of power three or greater. But more importantly, if an ability of a creature you control with power two or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. People are freaking out that this is going to be format warping and it's going to be completely broken. And then we look back at Elish Mommy, Mommy of Mommies, which triggers on everything. And though it is a powerful card, it is not format altering. And then uh, immediately after Elish Mommy, Mommy of Mommies came out, uh, Gandalf the White came out and he does that for legendary spells and artifacts. Yeah. So (laughs) this one does it for creatures you control with power two or less. Uh, which, I mean, you're going to get some powerful things like I'm, I'm a Dockside Extortionist, that yeah. kind of stuff. Um, but it's going to be a powerful card. By by every measure, it's going to be a powerful card. It's not going to be this like life-changing, like completely busted card. I mean, mm-hmm. People need to set their expectations appropriately for that, I think. Yeah, I think it's... I mean, it is also a mono-white commander mm-hmm. as far as it goes. Um, it does, it, you know, the, the unblockable... Power two or less can't be blocked by creatures with power three or greater. Um, hypothetically, you want to build this with uh, a decent amount of combat triggers. That yeah. would be really good. Combat triggers but would be good. Big booty bitches, <laughs> big as we like booty to call bitches. them. Uh, for, this is completely in the wrong color identity, but Atrada Deadly Fugitive, it's a 1-4, so that would go well. And it's mm-hmm. got other things, but I don't want to talk about that one. What, uh, do you have any cards that you want to pull out in particular? I mean, right next to it is uh, is an Expedited Inheritance. It's mm-hmm. two red red, or sorry, it's red red for an enchantment that says whenever a creature is dealt damage, its controller may exile that many cards from the top of their library. They may play those cards in until the end of their next turn. Um, so obviously this is great for red, <laughs> being some more impulse draw, and being a, I don't want to say unlimited form of uh, impulse draw, but there are so many things that or that just do one damage to every creature or tap and deal this much damage to you know, your, oh, yeah. your own creatures <clears throat> um, that you're going to get a lot of card selection there. It is symmetrical, so you do give your all your opponents access to this as well. Mm-hmm. But that being said, the uh, decks that are built around this sort of thing are going to be able to utilize it much better. Much better. And two mana <laughs> investment... Um, very cheap. You're going to be able to get that thing out early. And it's not going to draw a lot of ire mm-hmm. because other people are going to be able to benefit from it too. You're just going to be getting more value out of it. And it is a may ability, so you do not have to if yeah. you do not want to. So if you're going to, you know, if you don't want to, if you're getting down there and you don't want to deck yourself by accident, yeah. you don't have to. Or if another player doesn't want to exile things from the top of their library because they've been scrying and they yeah. want what's on the top of their library, so they don't have to. Uh, I want to pull out uh, Intrude on the Mind. 
It's a blue instant, three blue blue. You reveal the top five cards of your library, separate them into two piles. An opponent chooses one of those piles. You put that pile into your hand and the other pile into your graveyard. Does that sound familiar? It sounds a lot like Factor Fiction. It is exactly like Factor Fiction, but it's one more mana. Does it do anything else? Yeah. You create a zero zero colorless Thopter artifact creature token with flying and then put a plus one plus one counter on it for each card put into your graveyard this way. I will say it is flipped because with Factor Fiction, your opponent makes the two piles and you choose. Whereas you make in this one you make the two piles and they choose. That is true. That is true. So it's a little bit different, but one mana, and then you're getting a body on top of it mm-hmm. that in all likelihood is going to be larger than a 1-1. One, one. So you're basically getting a one mana 1-1 one, one on top of a, effectively a factor fiction. Yeah. So pretty good and at instant speed. Oh, yeah. And at instant speed. I want to look at this Kaya Spirit's Justice next. It's a it's an interesting one. And I'm not just, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm not quite sure about how I, how I feel about it. Um, close that ad. Yeah. All right, uh, Kaya Spirit of Justice, legendary planeswalker Kaya. Notably, she didn't lose her spark. Um, she has a static ability. Well, oh, she's two white black for a. Uh, comes in with three loyalty. Whenever one or more creatures you control and or creature cards in your graveyard are put into exile, you may choose a creature card from among them until the end of turn. Target token you control becomes a copy of it, except it has flying. Uh, her plus two is to surveil two, then exile a card from your graveyard. Her plus one. Uh, creates a 1-1 black and white spirit creature token with flying, and her minus two uh, has you exile a creature you control, and for each player, exile up to one creature that player controls. Um, this almost feels like it should be a commander, but she doesn't have the text on it that says Kaya Spirits Justice can be your commander. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Oathbreaker is a thing. True. Um, I don't know what this would really fit into. That's what I'm th- I'm saying. It's a neat idea, yeah. and it, it's definitely something you could build around. But, yeah, like, okay, so you're going to, you know, do you put this in a tokens deck? In which case, are you just looking to, you know, maybe exile, get rid of things in your graveyard that are better, you know, creator token creators and and rep that? I don't know. It's neat. I like the idea. I'm just not sure where to go with it without. I could see this in a, um, in a 1-1 like a, a, a one one soldier token strategy and it's got like a little aristocrat sub theme so like you're discarding or you're putting stuff into your graveyard and basically just trying to cheaply get them out and then just using her plus two to get things into your graveyard and surveil to just to like dig through your deck a little yeah, bit that's a little card selection i could see that um I'm interesting to see, I'm interested to see how that one will play out. I have two more that I want to talk about. Uh, I've actually got a lot that I want to talk about, but I'm going to l- limit myself to two. Okay. Yeah. Um, Pride of the Hulkling. Oh my God! This this is such a boy. <laughs> such a boy. <laughs> first of all, first of all, ten and a green. That's eleven CMC for a legendary creature, crocodile, elk, turtle. Again, a legendary creature, crocodile, elk, turtle, crocodile, elk. Like a deer. Yeah. And then turtle. Turtle. Yeah, he's got turtle shell, alligator heads, milk horns. Yeah. He's a 215, two power, 15 toughness. Big booty bitch. Big booty bitch. Big booty bitch. He's 11 mana. You might be thinking, Connor, why would I ever get a commander or cast a card that has 11 mana? That sounds ridiculous. Well, one, you're in green, so you can ramp to it. But more importantly, spell costs X less to cast where X is the total toughness of creatures you control. We'll get into that in a moment. He has Defender, and you can pay two blue blue until end of turn. Target creature you control gets plus one plus oh and gains. Whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw cards equal to its toughness and can attack as though it didn't have Defender. I just want to reiterate. I just want to reiterate something here. Defender wall strategies. Build the wall. The Trump deck, if you will. <laughs> yes. The Trump the Trump commander of Arcades. Okay, he's a strategist. Um Fits in this color identity. It's got green blue. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> this would be a bomb in that deck. This is a, this is for most instances, you've got two or three walls out. You can cast him for like two mana or less. Yeah. Minimum one mana, but that's fucking ludicrous <laughs> for a defender that you can invest four mana into and then be drawing, if he targeted himself and dealt combat damage to a player, 15 cards. Yeah. 
Or you target something else that has like six toughness and it happened to deal combat damage with the myriad of opportunities for with, with cards that allow defenders to A, attack, and B, deal damage with their toughness instead of their power. Motherfuckers are going to be drawn so many cards because of this. It is also... It is also an activated ability, yeah. so it's something that you can do after blockers are declared to see what's going to deal damage to someone. That's true. To then trigger it, to give it plus one, plus O, oh, and then also draw cards off of it. Oh, yeah. And also, he's got a big booty, and you know how many things in green with, uh, like, care about, oh, if you have a, cre- you know, gain life equal to this creature's toughness when it enters the battlefield or something like that. It's it's ludicrous. It's fucking cracked beyond belief. And now I wanna I wanna make like both Joe Biden and Donald Trump and build that wall. <laughs> that's a sure. That's my one political reference for the for the podcast. You have anything else you want to talk about? Absolutely. Uh, slime against humanity. Oh, where's that? I don't know. It seems to be in alphabetical order. Oh gosh. Well, tell us about slime against humanity. Slime against humanity is a sorcery, I believe, that says. Um, it's a green curd. What rarity? SL, is it? it should be in ra- It's either rare or uh. Go to the search at the top, would you? Uh, this is what we. Ha- this is what happens when we do it live, man. We, this is what happens. Fuck it, we, we do, do it live. live. There we go. Slime against humanity. Oh, it's a common. Uh, it's a. It's two and a green for a sorcery that says create a zero zero green ooze creature token oh, with trample. I've seen this one. Put X plus one counters on it, where X is two plus the total number of creature of cards you own in exile and in your graveyard that are named ooze, or uh, that are oozes or are named slime against humanity. A deck can have any number of cards named slime against humanity. Uh, so, you know, obviously we've seen cards that say you can have any number of these in your deck. With blue, it's per, uh, Persistent Parishioners. Uh, with red, it's Dragon's Approach. Mm-hmm. With black, there's like 17. <laughs> um, this, I believe, it's Nazgul. A, Nazgul. Uh, Nazgul, Rentless Rats. Pack Rats. Pack Rats. Yeah. Uh, the Shadowborn Apostles. Finally, we have one in green. Um, for them sick, nasty oozes. For them sick, nasty oozes. And, yeah, this can quickly quickly uh you know you can have any number of them you just want to have a deck with lands and slime against humanity and one commander one ooze commander like you're you're gonna have a lot of big big oozy boys and and they big grow trampling oozy boys they grow fast oh yeah so oh, the first one's gonna come in with two the second one's gonna come in with three but then if your graveyard gets tags out you don't care it's you you can even repeat though you know you can yeah, that's i think it's neat uh, it is a common, and the pre-release price is five dollars and eighteen cents, or the pre-sale price for this sort of single is. Yeah, those card, those cards are always um, the have any number of cards always have. Oh yeah. Ridiculous price tags in pre-release, but well, that's just kind of how it is. I mean, some of them persist, except for persistent parishioners. Yeah, well, that one also just is kind of a lesser effect. True. All things considered, um, I'm going to talk about one more. Okay. I don't know which one to do though. Uh, oh. Massacre Girl. Massacre Girl, yes. Known killer. Known killer. Two black, black for a 4 4 legendary creature, human assassin with menace. Creatures you control have Wither, which, if you do not know what Wither is, it's a keyword that says they deal damage to a creature in the form of, pl- of minus one, minus one counters so instead of just giving them damage and assigning them damage until end of turn you're giving them counters that reduce their power and their toughness uh with a second ability that is whenever a creature an opponent controls dies if its toughness was less than one draw a card so effectively if you kill it with your things that have wither that are dealing damage as minus one minus one counters you draw a card for everything that died Mm mm-hmm a four mana four four with menace that does all that. I think that's a very good card. Not necessarily a commander that I would build around, but a wonderful piece in a deck that has access to her. I would say. So I had two thoughts on this. Well, two thoughts, two separate thoughts. Uh, first thought uh, on the Pride of Hull uh, Hull Clade, um, friend of the show, typical Gemini pops in and says, also training grounds and biomancers familiar are uh, available to discount the activated cost. That's true. So you could be casting this for a lot less. You could be casting multiple times. Massacre Girl known killer uh my first thought with this was use it to make a 
Planeswalker, a, 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 a Super Friends deck with her as the commander. Using her at, using everything suddenly becomes um, a, a threat, basically. It's like, oh, you're, you're, you're going to try to attack my Planeswalker with, uh, you know, with your, with your indestructible 8-8? Okay, I'm going to block with a 1-1, but now your thing's a 7-7, and now it's a 6-6. Unfortunately, my uh, just because now they're great blockers, a great deterrent, because you don't want all your things losing their power and toughness. Yeah, yeah. The only th- problem I had with it was that there are basically three types of planeswalkers in mono black, and they all do very different things. Yeah, I mean that's a fun that's a fun idea. I like I like having there's some proliferate engines and some proliferate effects in black, mm-hmm. uh, but I can I can totally see like a Golgari proliferate like this like this is a great card just to slap into like a poison deck yeah oh yeah like just as some extra utility that benefits from the proliferation that ideally you would want to be doing because infect is mean (laughs) uh that those are all the cards i have to talk about you got anything else i have one more uh it's oh i have two more um one to say things on and one just because it's fun uh the one that i want to say things on is demand answers uh, demand answers is an instant for one and a red. It says as an additional cost of the spell, sacrifice an artifact or discard a card, draw two cards. This is a strictly better uh, thrill of possibilities because yeah. thrill yeah, possibilities. Is. You're playing, you're using a card and you're discarding a card to draw two cards. So you're technically you haven't gained any cards. With this one, you can actually gain a card if you decide to sacrifice uh, an artifact. Something like a clue token. A clue token. So you just basically got a free clue token. Yeah. Or, you know, you have food, you have scrap, you have treasure. You have so many things these days that are just small. Uh, and the last one is Tunnel Tipster. I just wanted to point him out because uh, he is such a boy. Oh, Look at his face. Oh, he's a cute little mole scout. Such a boy. If you haven't looked up Tunnel Tipster yet, look up Tunnel Tipster. Great, great little guy. Also, uh, I typed in Tunnel and I just want to shout out Escape Tunnel. Escape which is a strictly better evolving wilds. Yeah. It's an escape tunnel is a land. It's common. Tap, sack, search your library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield, tap, then shuffle. You can also tap and sack it and target creature with power two or less can't be blocked this turn. So are you going to be using both of the options? No. But if you're in a deck that's going to run evolving wilds, you might as well just run escape tunnel instead for that little extra added of utility. Honestly, I've been going through and removing a lot of Evolving Wilds, Tamarok Expanse, and, and, and Fetch Lands in general from my decks because I'm tired. Slow I, fetches. Slow, fl- slow fetches. I'm just like, oh, I don't want to do that. Uh, it's wasting my turn. But that is like, okay, yeah, if I'm playing a lower power deck, sure, that can go in very easily. End of the game, it's not dead in your hand. It's like, no. oh, you can. You usually have something with low power. That can help. It can, it can be can effective. Help. If you get it late, you don't have anything else to land drop. You can just slap it down. If you want to ramp a little bit, you can. And you just, it's just it's a strictly better Evolving Wilds in yeah. Terramorphic Expanse. You'll love it. You'll love to see it. Yes. Anything else you want to say about murders? Uh, I mean, Manor? I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we'll be getting some pre-release kits this Friday. Yep. Opening them on Monday at our Monday Night Magic. And then the week after, we'll be doing uh, another limited Yes, if you're watching this podcast when it goes live tomorrow, the 31st, we're getting them on the 2nd. We're going to be opening them on the 5th of February. And doing some limited a week later. Yes, indeed. Should be fun. Uh, Next, moving on to Dungeons & Dragons. We've got two Dungeons & Dragons things uh, before we do a little quick wrap-up with magic. But uh, 1D&D Player's Handbook Survey Results. uh, As we are recording this podcast like two hours ago, they put up a video of uh, talking about the survey results for the, I believe it was Barbarian, Monk, and... Druid. Druid, yes. And... They went over the results of that, as well as giving some other important bits of information that yes. I want to talk about. Um, the monk now has a massively high approval rating; like it has jumped past the ranger mm-hmm. in approval rating improvement at this point. We kind of discussed that when that uh, playtest came out. Yeah, that we were excited for the monk. Uh, Barbarian was already liked, and people still like the druid in a good spot. Like we knew that already, but the monk has lurched forward in usability. 
Yeah, a lot with it with the how they reconfigured the uh, the the ability points, the spirit points, and how they changed up some of the uh, uh, the monks just base abilities not to require those, mm-hmm. uh, making not only the 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 monks always been the kind of the highest floor of all the classes, uh, but now it it's raised that up to make it just more you across the board utility. The floor is higher and the ceiling is higher. The ceiling yes. was always very low on the monk. Yeah, you had a very small range which your monk mm-hmm. would be. Yeah, extraordinary in it was going to be good yeah your monk was pretty much always going to be good it just wasn't going to be fantastic yeah and now it has the opportunity to be fantastic while being even more gooder or more gooder it, yeah yeah great yeah okay but that's less important there's two little bits of information i'm gonna go with the smaller one here the dwarf image that was being sent around the picture the 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 art of a dwarf Mm -hmm. that they showed like a month or two ago and people were like oh my gosh it's got ai art in it no it didn't people need to call like yes wizards has a history of using ai art when they're not supposed to but like wolf don't cry wolf all the time but uh, people were saying that this dwarf image, it looked like it was going to be used as the cover for the player's handbook, and they reiterated that they have not revealed any of the covers for nope. any of the core books yet, and that the dwarf the dwarf image that we are talking about is going to be used alongside the fighter as part of key art, because they're going to be doing new key art for all of the classes, as well as a whole bunch of other extra key arts for various things, which is exciting. The more important thing here, and we've been saying this, Basically, since they announced 1D&D, ourselves and, like, everyone talking about 1D&D, that we were all expecting it to come out in the spring of 2024, Mm -hmm. May 2024. They wanted to reiterate something here, and they brought it up very casually, like, oh, these silly people. It's like, no, we've been thinking this for, like, a year. Yeah. Like, Like, it was a poor communication. But this is the quote. We realized there was an erroneous release date published with regards to the 2024 Player's Handbook. That was definitely incorrect. The Player's Handbook is not releasing in May, parentheses, but it will be coming this year, close parentheses. Stay tuned for an official announcement soon. Womp womp. Yeah. They said they will still be working on the books in May. Yes. So they're not they're not close to releasing these books. Uh, At this point we should be looking towards almost sounds like Christmas time. I would say I would say late fall, early winter at this point. But one thing I will say is we were wondering how are they going to make the release dates work yeah. for Vecna, Eve of Ruin, and Quest from the Infinite Staircase? Mm-hmm. And now I think we see where that space is coming from because they gave us, we realized that there was an erroneous release date published. Yeah. So, oops, sorry. <laughs> Oopsie doopsie. We made a little fucky wucky. Yeah. But we now realize how they're going to be releasing all these things. We're not going to have, like, five books being released on top of each other across two different systems. We're get, they're going to give Vecna, Eve of Ruin a little bit of space to breathe. They're going to give Quest from the Infinite Staircase a little bit of space to breathe. And now we can be expecting one D&D probably later in the fall. Yeah, late in the year. Um, I can see them doing it. They're like, hey, Merry Christmas. Bye, everybody. You know, D&D mm-hmm. books for Christmas. I think they definitely will want to have it out around Black Friday. That makes sense. That's when um, you start buying Christmas presents. Yeah. If I you're s- bad people like me. That's true. I suspect that you're going that we're going to be able to go to Gen Con this year and see a lot more details about the player's handbook, the Dungeon yeah. Master's Guide, and all that kind of stuff. Maybe get some hands on. We'll definitely have to keep an eye out for any sort of panels or any sort of mm-hmm. play tests or any anything like that. Absolutely. Um, I would love to participate in a one D and D play test at Gen Con. Oh, I that'd think be that'd cool. be really really fun. I think that'd be really fun. We need to. We need to get on that. We, we were do. not very on about getting our events this year, and we kind of missed out on a couple opportunities. But yeah, um, or last year. last year we had a. I mean, we had a, a, a bevy of different reasons why we weren't on top of things. But uh, that being said, Gen Con uh, uh, Gen Con tickets go on sale February eleventh. Yes, very soon. So we'll be we'll be ready for that. Very very soon. We we'll need to try to do the thing. We do. Yeah, we yeah. do need to try to do the yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Uh, the other D and D thing that we want to talk about, and this is more exciting for me, because when they first announced 
one D&D. They showed alongside it Unreal Engine mm-hmm. gameplay footage of their own virtual tabletop that they're developing that's going to tie in with one D&D or D&D Beyond. Yes. And that kind of stuff. And we were very excited about it, talking about all the possibilities for that, how they could make D&D Beyond like this integrated platform that is like the place to go and they could really revitalize it and make it a place worth going. And they're kind of starting to do that with a trickle of like very select third party content and obviously I think the VTT is going to be very good. Mm-hmm. I suspect it will. But there's been a new partnership that Wizards of the Coast has announced with Resolution Games to bring Dungeons and Dragons to virtual reality. So obviously Wizards of the Coast has been bringing D and D IP to the forefront in the video game space. Mm-hmm. Baldur's Gate 3, absolutely massive. They're making their own VTT. Uh, they've even, even with um, Honor Among Thieves, is kind of that other, they're going a lot cross media. That's true, this. yeah. Uh, Resolution Games, you might be familiar if you're in the VR gaming space, Oculus Quest, MetaQuest, uh, it's on PlayStation VR 2. They, they're best known for their game, Demio. It recreates a tabletop gaming experience digitally, whether on a VR headset, or you can even do it on like an iPad and you don't need a VR headset. And if you look at gameplay footage of this, they create their own kind of tabletop gaming system yeah, uh, and then create a video game around it. But then they've been releasing more and more updates and it's like they have AR VR. So you can sit at on your couch and then you can have the table the the game space yeah. virtually represented on your coffee table yeah. for example um and they've shown people virtually like painting miniatures and building terrain and setting up battle maps and that kind of stuff and now wizards of the coast has officially announced a partnership with them are we going to be getting finally the thing that i've been <laughs> saying would be a fucking brilliant idea since they announced 1 D and announced their own virtual tabletop of a VR compatible virtual tabletop with officially licensed D&D content? Seems it seems like it might be possible. I would be fucking thrilled. <laughs> I would be thrilled. Now, we don't know the details of the deal quite yet. Are they going to simply be licensing the IP for a single player mm-hmm. style um game in VR? Like they they Demio is you get the vibe that it's kind of like it's a it's a co-op multiplayer game, but it also had like they did their own story, they did their own stuff. Are we going to get like a blend of something like a Baldur's Gate 3 with a with a written story and written outcomes yeah. mixed with more traditional tabletop RPG elements and then play it in VR in a virtual tabletop? Or are we going to literally be getting a virtual tabletop that we don't quite know yet? Uh, but the the idea that they could create this virtual tabletop and use VR to make that way more accessible and way more immersive and more like and use virtual tabletops and digital gameplay to more accurately emulate the real life tabletop experience, yeah. I think is a very exciting aspect and opportunity they have here. Yeah. You got anything you want to say, or or here's, you not really care? I mean, here's what I'll say: is like we've you said you've been we've been heralding this. We'll, say, we'll call it heralding. You are the harbinger, um, and I think uh, in general that's the way a lot of things are going to start to go. But especially during the pandemic, we saw kind of the first real rise in uh, uh, the popularity of online and virtual tabletops, mm-hmm. uh, and people were asking for you know well. We're, we're lusting for something like this mm-hmm. during those times when we couldn't go outside, um, except for your, your your one walk a day. Your one day. walk a day, the grocery store where uh, COVID stopped spreading when you... T- it was, I digress. <laughs> anyway, but uh, that being said, VR, still, uh, still not that widespread. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, it's, gonna, it's coming down the pipe. I do say the the uh, author of this <laughs> article we are looking at uh, does voice their concerns about um, basically Wizards of the Coast trying to kill the the local tabletop, you know, kill the in person sort of thing. <sighs> that, I think that is a bit of a stretch. It's a very big stretch, especially since you know we've all had experience again back to the COVID thing or with your new Nether Deep campaign. You're playing with people who aren't 
right down the road from us. Yeah. Um, so. Or even like a 30 minute drive. Yeah. You know, like I'm playing, I'm going to be playing with people that are like an hour and a half away. Mm-hmm. So virtual is the way we are able to play. Um, I, I think looking at this from the perspective of wizards trying to kill whatever by partnering, I think that's utterly ridiculous. That's a terrible take. I think wizards is just trying to get, get more money out of, uh, yeah. out of their, out of their, out of our, out of their cash cows that are us. Yeah. Well, they're, they're trying, they're trying to utilize their IP, which yeah. any company, any creative industry, that's what companies are going to do is they're Absolutely. going to utilize their IP as best as they can. Um, I'm excited to see what we learn about this because if it's if it's like a, a VR single player experience, then neat. But yeah. if they were doing a VR single player experience, there's other developers they could partner with that are going to be more accurate to that. The fact that they're partnering specifically with Resolution Games the creators of Demio and looking at what Demio is and what it has become Mm -hmm. really indicates that it's going to be this really nice virtual tabletop with at the very least licensed D and D IP access, probably for the game system. Mm -hmm. I think that's fucking awesome. Pretty cool. I would, I would love to look into that. This might be the thing that gets me into VR. If that is the case. Uh, again, there's no details. We don't have a release date. Simply an announcement of a collaboration, but an exciting one, nonetheless. Do you have anything? Else I will you say, add? I don't paint minis in real life. I'm not going to do it in VR. It's probably a lot easier in VR. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucked up. Back it's very. It's very. Um, it, it gives Hero Forge. It gives Hero Forge. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's giving Hero Forge. It's giving Hero Forge. <laughs> uh, last little wrap up item. This is the last thing. Magic the Gathering. They're going to be celebrating the Chinese New Year, Year of the Dragon, with their uh, 2024 APAC League and Lunar New Year celebration, which is going to kick off on February 10th. They've got a lot of promo cards with new art that they're going to be handing out to participants. Uh, local Match of the Gathering WPN stores are going to start the festivities February 10th, and that will run through March 31st. They're going to be running standard, sealed, and booster draft events. Players who participate are going to receive one copy of Sarkon, Unbroken, Dragon Lord's Servant, and a 4-4 Dragon Token while stocks last. These are in new Chinese New Year arts that are going to be exclusive to this event. Uh, competition is going to heat up with APAC Qualifier Seasons. Uh, There's going to be four seasons spanning across four different sets released in 2024. Every participating player is going to receive a seasonal dragon-themed promo card. And then the top two in each qualifier season will receive an invite to the the end-of-the-year championship event in December. Qualifying seasons are as follows. The first season is going to be the standard format using Outlaws of Thunder Junction. The promo is going to be a Steel Hellkite. Qualifier Season 2 is going to be Modern, Standard, Draft, or Sealed formats. Going to be Modern Horizons 3 with a Full Art Mountain as the promo. Qualifier Season 3 is going to be a Standard-only format during Bloomborough with the promo of Corvold, Fake Cursed King, with Season 4 wrapping up with Duskmorn, House of Horror, with the promo of Dragon Tempest. Love a promo card. Yeah. Love the Chinese New Year. I will say, uh, the girl I have been seeing. I ooh, I can officially say my girlfriend. <gasps> oh, yes. Oh, it has been approved. Approved. It has been approved by the lady. Okay. I can call her my girlfriend. She uh, she teaches a lot of uh, various nationality students, and so they always make a point to go over like specific culture, nationalities, holidays, and traditions. Mm-hmm. So they did a whole thing on the Chinese New Year, and she's a big fan of all that kind of Chinese New Year celebration shit. So gotcha. this is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, also, some pretty neat arts and some uh, interesting reprints. I will say they didn't go, you know, I mean, obviously they're very thematic, which ones they chose to do for this. Uh, but these are not uh, hugely valuable reprints by any means. No, I mean, there's um, going to be some fun things that are played with a lot. Like, I mean, Corvold. Corvold, very popular aristocrats commander. Um, Dragon Lord Servant goes in like every dragon's deck. <laughs> yeah, uh, Steel Hellkite is in every precon of anything related to a dragon. Yeah, uh, I will say, wish we were better at standard so we could, uh, you know, hop on this. But we play, we don't, we suck. Yeah. You just need to participate to get the promos. True, but making the qualifier if you're into the if you're into the standard format in particular, check it out. You're gonna get a lot of cool promos. I will say, I'm su- 
maybe uh, maybe not surprise is the best word, but uh, there are none of the Kamigawa dragons in here. Yeah, yeah. That there's seems two like sets be... of those that are very valuable. I know. That would that would be, that would. I don't know. I don't maybe know. they were very specific on on staying away from those. There might be a reason. Who knows? There might be, Who but uh, yeah. Well, we're going to probably not collect any of those. But <laughs> also want to get a stand. You want to get in standard? I mean, I feel like I could. I, I feel like I could fuck with standard a little bit. I mean, I, I, I need to. I need to get in a mindset. You know, I had a mono on arenas. I had a mono red standard, uh, like burn spell slinger prowessy deck using uh the dwarven forge chanter and like oh, monastery yeah. swift spear and uh like that kind of stuff but i did i did i did pretty well in arenas i didn't do like phenomenal yeah but i i was able to get up to like mid silver tier and i probably could have gotten higher i just stopped playing arenas <laughs> that's fair that's fair <laughs> But that is all of the news items that we have for this episode of the Duels of Mana Dorks podcast. Uh, we were going to end this podcast with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the TikTok live chat as we record this podcast live on TikTok on Tuesdays, every other Tuesday at noon-ish Eastern Standard Time. And then the podcast goes up promptly at 1230 the next day, Wednesday, 1230 Eastern Standard Time. You can get it on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, our YouTube channel. We're going to be doing some clips, maybe even a video podcast version. Ooh. We'll see how that works out. And then, of course, you can follow us on the aforementioned TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Discord, all that kind of stuff. Check mm -hmm. us out for Monday Night Magics on TikTok. And Sam, what do you got from the TikTok chat? Uh, Chris Whipkey at, um, says, Assassin's Creed is coming to MGTG? Question mark. Yes, Chris. Uh, Assassin's Creed, Fallout, um, Final Fantasy, and Marvel are all slated for the next two years. Yeah, a lot of universes beyond. If you're into that sort of thing. Yeah, Marvel's going to becoming a become a be a multi set ten not multi. Uh, multi-release tentpole set for the first one too um, da -da -da -da, I want to shout out Ladang Blanche who was in our live last night Can't, ch jumping in and helping out uh, answering some questions for us thank you Ladang uh, Roman just became the number 36 member of the team welcome Wonderful. other than that there's not too much uh, Alien, Alan711 said they would love to see a War Machine VR uh, tabletop um, fun. I'm sure that there's going to be I mean there are already several like um virtual tabletops that exist mm -hmm. and i'm sure as this becomes more available and more developers become mm -hmm. in uh, you know experienced with creating vr a lot more things that we we know are going to continue to roll onto those sorts of platforms i will say if you're into like the 3d virtual tabletops you should check out dungeon alchemist uh, it's, you can get it's a game basically that lets you just design th uh, uses AI to like auto generate stuff, but you can also meticulously design 3D battle maps. Mm -hmm. uh, it also has an export feature so that you can export it for Foundry VTT with that includes wall data and lighting information and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but yeah, have uh, I'm I'm waiting for like that one all in one like integrated solution that just works. And it's like a lot simpler than Foundry VTT. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about these tabletops is they are tools, right? Mm -hmm. They're not just, they're not just, you know, uh, these aren't paint. I think everybody's expecting them to be MS paint when they go in. They are, they are Photoshop, you know? They are very deep, you, deep Photoshop. You got to learn, they have so you know, they have so many different tools. You have to learn how to use each tool. You got to go through, you better watch, you know, you, you can watch a tutorial to make your life easier, but you're still just going to, the only thing that's going to get you good at it is experience using it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, hello, MTG Craze, and hello, Solas. Other yeah. than that, mm -hmm. it's a pretty chill episode. I feel like we're on the eve of a lot of of a lot of things. It's like I feel like we're all in like a holding pattern. We're just like waiting. Yeah. Like, we're getting our magic sets. Yeah. Nothing too crazy. Just some new magic. Sets. Like we're waiting for like the big thing. The big thing. And hopefully, hopefully it's not a controversy. Hopefully the big thing is something great. Yeah. Hopefully the the big thing is ooh, you can get all the one D and D books for five dollars as 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 a promotion. Yeah. No, just, that's, just permanently. Yeah, that's you're getting premium hardcover versions, five dollars, all three of them, one payment of five dollars. Yes. Once we. That's my prediction right now. That's right. a bad prediction. That's a really bad prediction. Really, really bad prediction. Uh, well, do you have anything else you want to say, Sam? Do you have any words for the people at home? Um, 
don't. That's it. Don't. Don't. Just don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's uh, let's end this episode as we like to end our episodes with what I like to I I, I end all of our game nights with. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Let's long strider through this Demir Guildcade out of this Ravnica rabble rousing raucous uh, uh, revelry. That one, that one was. You were just saying words. That that one got out of control real fast. 